Hi everyone, this is Photoshop Basics for Designers in the latest version of Adobe Photoshop CC with Guru99. We're going to cover a lot of features which are commonly used by each and every designer to create some composites or any design or to make any illustrations or even just do some simple retouching. So we're going to cover some of the most common features like workspace, layers, smart objects, blend modes, selections techniques, filters, and much more necessary features that every designer uses to work on Photoshop. Now we will start with the first topic about workspace. We will see in this how we can set up our Photoshop to the most useful workflow because there are so many industries which use Photoshop in so many different ways for their specific purpose. So let's get started and talk about workspace in Photoshop CC. In this video, we'll learn how to create workspaces to customize Photoshop as per your workflow. We all use Photoshop for different purposes, such as photo editing, graphics designing, 3D designing, and video editing. Photoshop can do many things, and you are able to customize your own workflow in Photoshop. And you can individually deal with all the panels which you want to see or not see on your workflow. Depending on your work purpose, there might be some panels which you are never going to use, and you never need to see those panels. So you can create your own workspace depending upon what you're working on. Right now, I've got a default workspace known as Essentials. We can find workspace panels on the second top position of the window menu. And you can see here some preset workspaces designed for specific industries, like if I want to work on 3D in Photoshop, then I'll select 3D in workspace panels and make all specific panels visible which are related to 3D and needed to edit 3D objects, such as 3D panel, layers, channels, properties. All these are related to editing 3D objects. Let's see more about motion workspace. If I wanted to do some animation, then this workspace is useful for that. In this, you can see Timeline Panel and some other panels which are needed to work with video and animation. Now go to Workspace and check out Photography Workspace, which is useful if we wanted to do some photo editing. It'll show panels which are related to photography purposes. These are all some preset workspaces but now I want to create my own workspace because of my working methods. I already know which panels I need and which panels I don't need to work on. Look here. I have already created my own workspace called Guru99 Workspace. Select it and check it. In this workspace, I have some selected panels, such as Brush, History, Character, Layers, Channels, Paths, Adjustments, swatches, and color. Now let's see how to create a new custom workspace. So arrange all the individual panels as per your need. When you've done that, go to Window Menu, then Workspace, then click on New Workspace. Now give any name to your own workspace. Here you can save any keyboard shortcuts in your workspace and even menus you can set. You can keep visible only the menus you want in your workspace. Then click Save. Now you can see your workspace is created. And if you're new to Photoshop, then it will take time to develop your habits and realize which panels are useful and which are not useful for the way you work. Let's talk about layers. 
Layers is the one thing that makes Photoshop an amazing photo editing and compositing tool. Layers allow you to work non-destructively by stacking images on top of other images without interacting and mixing the pixels of those images. We can add them or delete them at any time we want. Now when you create an image or open an image in Photoshop, it's visible in the Layers panel. Let me drag out the Layers panel. You can see by default a background layer, and you can notice a lock symbol on it. So the layer is locked. It means you can't move or do anything like that because the layer is locked. So to unlock a layer, we have different options. One of them is we can double click on a locked layer. It will show you a pop-up where you can change the name of that locked layer and then press OK. Now you can see our layer is unlocked and its name is also changed. Now you can easily move the layer and when you move it, you'll see the transparency checker pattern behind the layer. This all indicates a transparent background. You can customize it in the preferences. Now let's see another option to unlock the layer. You just need to grab that lock symbol and drag it to the trash, and it simply unlocks the layer. Now this is the background layer. To add more images, press the Shift key and drag and drop the image to the center. You can see what happened in the layer panel. It has created a new layer on top of the layer panel instead of adding or mixing the pixels with the background layer. In the layer panel, you can see each layer has an eye symbol. By clicking on the eye symbol, you can turn each layer on or off. There are two images, but now let's check about text. Add some text and then look into the layer panel. A new text layer is created on the top. So the main thing about the layer system is to keep every single item in a different layer and don't let any of them destroy or mix with each other. Now let's talk about one of the greatest features of layers, the layer mask. A layer mask can hide or reveal pixels of a layer without deleting them. Without the help of layer masks, if we want to hide some part of the image, then we have to delete that part by using the eraser tool in the tools panel. Let's try it. In this method, the problem is, once you have deleted a part of the image, then it's permanently deleted from the image. So if we want to bring those pixels back, then it's not possible. Now let's try it using the layer mask. So first, undo erasing. Layer mask is another image attached to the layer. You can take a layer mask by clicking on this icon. Or the other option is to select the layer and open Layer Menu and then go to Layer Mask and choose Reveal All. You've noticed it adds a new layer filled with white color and the white color will reveal everything on the image. Now I want to hide some part of the image, so for that, instead of using the Eraser tool, you have to choose the Brush tool. And we can see that the layer mask is filled with white color, so I'm going to paint with black color. You can notice that I'm doing the same thing that I would have done before using the Eraser tool. But in this, I haven't deleted anything. I'm just hiding those pixels with the use of the layer mask. Look at the layer mask. It's painted this area with black color, and that black color is hiding what is on the layer. If I press Shift key and click on that layer mask, then the mask will be disabled, and it reveals everything on that layer. That means I've deleted nothing. So this was the basic concept of layer mask. Now let's talk about blending modes. Blending mode allows you to blend any layer with another below it. For example, if I select this layer and go to blending mode and change it to overlay from normal, look how it's blended with the background image. You can try different blend modes. But the good thing is that the layer is not mixed up with the other layer. It's still separate. If I change the blend mode to normal, then I can get my original image back as it was before. These were all the basic concepts of layer systems in Photoshop. We can add different things in layers, whether it's text, images, shapes, or in the latest version of Photoshop, we can even add a 3D model in layer panels and work on that.
A very important part of Photoshop tools are the use of the layer mask that gives the ability to hide and reveal parts of the layer without deleting them. This is a very effective and non-destructive way of working, and it helps designers to become more efficient and more creative. Let's try to make an image with the help of a layer mask so that you can understand exactly what the layer mask works for. I want to make a movie poster for a well-known Hollywood movie, Avengers. So let's start working on it. I'm using this image as the background for the poster. These all are images which are going to be used in the poster. This is our background layer, and we will take all the other images one by one and set them all in the sky portion of the background. So let's take the first one. I'm choosing Iron Man first because I want to put him at the middle of the sky. Scale the image and set its position properly. Then take a layer mask for the image. Then grab the paintbrush tool with smooth round brush, set the brush size, and start painting on the image to hide unwanted parts of the image. Look at the layer mask. It displays some black area in which you have painted, and the black color hides pixels. Now go for the next image, Captain America and do the same process as we have done before on the Iron Man image. And do the same process again on the other three images which we are using in this file. Let's speed it up. Now put Iron Man on the top of the layer panel, because it is in the middle portion, so it will not look so good to be behind all the other layers. See, the bottom edges of all the images are still sharp, so it looks very bad. So grab the brush tool and make all the bottom edges blur, so that all the images can look properly merged. Once you're done with it, then select all five images and press Ctrl plus G to put them all in a single group. And change the blend mode of that group to screen, and it looks like it's nicely blended with the sky. Then make the image more effective with the help of curves. Now we need to give a title to this poster. I have one image that we can use in this poster. Scale and arrange the position of the image. Now take a layer mask for this image and start painting with black color and smooth round brush on the unwanted parts of the image. Remove all that black color around the name. And then change the blending mode to Linear Dodge. Drag it down below the curve layer. Now save the file and take a look at it. It looks awesome. We designed this poster very quickly and easily with the help of a layer mask. Now just remember that black color hides pixels and white color reveals pixels. So now you can understand how important the layer mask tool is in Photoshop. This was the layer mask tool. Now go ahead to the next topic, shape layer. Let's talk about layer styles in Photoshop. In this tutorial, we will learn about how to apply layer styles and how to share them between layers, and how to utilize layer styles to make our content more appealing. Look, in this I've applied some layer styles to this word, www.guru99.com. Here you can see some layer styles like bevel and emboss, stroke, gradient overlay, and drop shadow. 
We can turn them on or off individually or all together. And this FX icon indicates this layer has applied a layer style. To apply a layer style to a layer, you need to select the layer and go to Layer Menu, then Layer Style, and choose any of the layer styles you want to apply. And it will open the Layer Style panel where you are able to edit each and every layer style as per your requirement. Here I have already applied some layer styles like Bevel and Emboss. I've got some options in that. I can easily edit them. Then I got Stroke and Gradient Overlay and Drop Shadow. All these have their own and different customizable options. If you want to add or subtract any layer style, then just click on it. Another way to apply a layer style is at the bottom of the layer panel. Have a look at this FX icon. By clicking on this button, you will have the same options that you have seen in the layer menu. Now let's talk about sharing layer styles between two layers. So here I have one more text layer, Free Online Education. There are many different ways to share layer styles. Here's a very quick way. Hold down the Alt key and grab the FX icon and drop it on the layer to which you want to apply the same layer styles. It will copy and paste the layer style in one single move. Another way is just right click on the layer having the layer style and select Copy Layer Style and go and right click your target layer and select Paste Layer Style. Now if you think you don't like this layer style, then you can easily grab the FX icon and drag it to the trash. It will only delete the layer style and not the layer itself. One more way, you can simply right click on the layer and choose Clear Layer Style and it will clear all the layer styles which you have applied on that layer. One more important thing is that you can also detach layer styles from their layer. For that, you simply need to right-click on the FX icon and choose Create Layers. It will create layers for each and every layer style that you have applied to your layer. You can also turn them on and off, and you can work on them as separate layers. One more thing about layer style is that if a layer style is applied to a text layer, then it is easily editable. So go ahead and retype, and you will get the same effects on new typed words. Let's talk about shape layers in Photoshop CC. Like the pen tool, shape layer also uses vector technology. You will get shape layer tool right here in the toolbar. Now click on that and you can see various shapes like rectangular tool, rounded rectangular tool, ellipse tool, polygon tool, line tool, and custom shape tool. By selecting these items, you can draw them as regular paths or in a shape layer. See in the options bar, on the second position, you can see a menu. It will show you three options to draw your shape like path, shape, and pixels. Now pixel fills the drawn path with pixels. This option does not use vector technology. And path will draw only the path of the shape. It will not fill in any color in the path. But here I select shape option and then you can see some various options here. I can select fill color, stroke color, stroke type, and many more options here. Now draw the shape and see in the layer panel a new layer was created there. You can see a small path icon on the layer. It's indicating this layer is a shape layer. You can see there are some control handles of the vector shape. If you want to edit the color of the shape, then just go outside and double click on the shape layer and you will get the color picker. These are vector shapes, meaning they are resolution independent and I can drag and use them in any document and I can scale them up and down without any loss of quality because they are using vector technology instead of pixel technology. Let's see a useful aspect of shape tools, the custom shape tool. 
This gives you lots of ready-made shapes and you can easily use them when you want. All these shapes are included in this pop-up menu by numbers of different categories, but right now I'm choosing all so that I can get all the shapes out there in the list. Now choose the shape that you want to use. To draw the shape, you can simply click on the work area if you want to draw it with any specific size, or you can simply drag and draw the shape to create the shape layer. Let's edit shape's color and stroke properties in this options bar at the top. Now if you want to subtract some part inside the shape, then I'll go and select Ellipse Tool. And I'll go here and set the Pathfinder feature to subtract from the shape. And if I draw a circle inside here, then it's going to subtract that area from the main shape. I can also change the position of the shape. So this was a brief overview about the shape layers in Photoshop. You can create various kinds of designs with the help of the shape layer without losing any quality because it uses vector technology. Now let's go ahead to our next topic, Smart Object. In this video, I'll help you to understand about Smart Objects in Photoshop. Every designer must know about the benefits of Smart Objects. The main intention of Smart Objects is to never lose the quality of any vector object or an image, even if we rescale or resample it, or change its position or rotate it however we want in our document. This means you bring in any photographs or any vector objects in your document, and you scale it down and you scale it up again. In this process of scaling up and down the image, if you do not want to lose the real quality of your image, then you must make that image a smart object first. Let's see an example so that you can get the actual idea of smart objects. Here I have a vector object in Illustrator. I copy this object by pressing Ctrl plus C, then go to Photoshop and press Ctrl plus V to paste. When I paste it in Photoshop, it gives four different options to choose from, like Smart Object, Pixel, Path, and Shape Layer. This time I'm going to select Smart Object. Press OK. So here is our vector object with good quality. See there in the Layer panel, the layer has a small icon button on the corner of it. This small icon indicates this is a Smart Object. Now. Press Ctrl plus T to scale down the object. Press Ctrl plus T again and scale it up, and hit Enter. You can see here that the quality and sharpness of the object is the same as before we scaled it down. It hasn't lost even 1% of the quality. Now switch off this layer and press Ctrl V to paste again but this time I'm going to select Pixels. The object is in its original quality now, but once we scale it down and scale it up again, you can see how it's losing the real quality of the object. It has been blurred and lost too much color information of the object. Let's see the reason why the object hasn't lost its information when it's converted to a smart object and why it lost them all when it was a normal layer. Take the Smart Object layer and scale it down and rescale it up again. You can see that it doesn't lose any color information and remains sharp, and that's because it's embedded inside of the Smart Object, which means it's referring to the original vector information instead of referring pixel information when it was imported. And now let's talk about the object which we have imported as pixel. When we scale it down, it doesn't need much information to display at the smaller size, so it throws away extra information which is not needed to display it. Now when we are scaling it back up, it doesn't remember that extra information which was thrown away when we scaled it down. So you can see how it has lost some of its quality and sharpness 
and how bad that looks. If you're a designer and you're working on composite design in Photoshop and you're using different objects in your work and you're rescaling, resampling, rotating, and repositioning them to get the right look, it's definitely going to decrease the real quality of the images if they're not converted to smart objects. Now let's check this on a photograph. Here I have a photograph and I've already extracted it from the background to a separate layer. Now drag and drop it to our file without converting it to a smart object. This image is much larger than our file size, so let's scale it down. Now I don't know if you can see or not, but each and every time that we rescale it up and down, it degrades the quality of the image. Now scale it back up and notice how it is degrading the quality from the real image. Now go to the other document and right click on the image layer and convert it into a smart object. Then drag and drop to our main file and scale it down, change its position, and rescale it back up again. Now you can see the images haven't lost a bit of quality from the original image. Compare the smart object and a normal layer. You can see the difference between the two. So now I hope that the concept of a smart object is very clear in your mind and you can take advantage of it while designing. Whether it is an image or a photograph or a vector object, you can independently rescale or resample it or do anything without losing the original quality of the particular object. Let's talk about blend modes. It's an awesome feature of Photoshop which every designer should know about. Blend modes is a way to blend pixels of two images with each other to get different types of effects. Now let's see how blend mode works into the layer panel. There are so many reasons for blend modes to be popular among you designers. You can correct the photos, you can convert a lighter image to a darker one or a darker image to a lighter one or you can create several types of effects by using a particular blend mode for particular images. Here I have a rough texture image for my background. I was going to use another image and blend it with this background. Here is the blend mode menu at the top of the layer panel, and by default it always is on normal mode. There are various types of blending modes grouped in various categories in the list. You can choose any one of them and create a different effect every time. Let me take another image to blend with the background texture. So here are two different layers. To apply blending mode, you need to select the layer and open the blend mode list and choose any one of them. In blending mode list, each group of blend modes have certain functions. Like the first selection here darkens the image. It affects only the overall darkness of the image. The second group affects the overall lightness of the image. It allows lighter areas to show through and makes darker areas drop back. The next group affects the lightness and darkness both. I choose Overlay here. The next group creates inverted effects. And the last group in the list deals with the colors of images. You can also change blend modes sequentially by pressing up and down arrow keys. I think Multiply is a better option for this image. It gives a striking look to this image. We can also get blending modes in Layer Style panel. For that, let me draw a new shape. Then give some layer style to it so that we can check blending modes there in Layer Style panel. Let me check on Outer Glow and set its parameters. Now you can see on top the same list of blend modes over here, which was in the blend mode menu out there in the layer panel. You can choose any blend mode you want. One more thing is you can play with opacity of the layer when using the blend modes to get better results. See, I'm using color burn mode. I like this blending effect, but it has over brightened the image so I can drag down the opacity of the background layer to set the image properly. Now you can see the difference. 
Now I hope you get the basic idea of how powerful a feature the blend mode is. In this video, we're going to talk about the Pen Tool. I'll show you how you can use the Pen Tool for selection. There are numbers of selection tools in Photoshop, but the Pen Tool is the only tool that gives you very clean and sharp selections without blurred lines or soft edges, because the Pen Tool uses vector technology. So if you want to cut out any object with clean, sharp edges, then you must have some knowledge about the Pen Tool. So let's start with it. Here's my image, then I want to cut out this sunglass with the help of the pen tool. So let's go and select the pen tool in the toolbar. There are different types of pen tools, as we can see, but right now I'm using this first pen tool. When you start drawing a path with the pen tool, I suggest you start it from any corner point of the object and take very few control points. Now click and drag it and you can see a moving handle of a control point. It bends the path, as you can see. We can set our path properly with the help of this handle. Now click and drag for the next control point and bend its handle this way to set it properly. You can see here the path gets out of line because when drawing the previous control point, we have bent its handle. So to overcome this problem, just hold the Alt key and click on the last control point before you create a new one. It will remove the handle and allow you to draw the path properly. Continue drawing the path like this. Let me speed this up. This is the path panel. In this you can see the path you have drawn before sometime. Just double click on it and save it. I did not need it so I'm deleting it. Here's the path which I have created before. Click on it and see at the bottom of the path panel there is an icon called Load Path as Selection. By clicking on this icon you can convert the path into a selection. So now select the layer and press Ctrl plus J to create a new layer of the selected portion. Here I want to cut this hole properly from the path. So I have to go to the path panel and select my path again and see here in the Pathfinder options I have to choose Subtract Front Shape. Now draw the path at the edge of that hole and select it and delete it. Let me zoom in here. Here you can see the edges of the object are still very sharp. They've not been blurred. So, with the help of the pen tool, you can get very clean, sharp, and accurate extraction, more than any other extraction technique in Photoshop because it follows vector technology. In this video, we're going to discuss a few quick and cool extraction techniques. As a designer, we should know some quick and efficient techniques to extract some particular object or design element from an image. Let's start with the first example. This is an image of a model with clean white background, and we want to extract the model. We can extract this with the help of the pen tool, but it will be very time-consuming technique so we can't follow that. So now go and grab the magic wand tool and click on the white background to select it. To add a selection area, hold the shift key and click on the portion which you want to add in selection. Now we want to extract the model, so we have to select her, go to the select menu and choose inverse, so it will invert the selection. Our selection is done but it still is not perfectly selected because it has some very sharp edges selected around it and some pixel is not selected on some of the edges and some unwanted pixels are also selected. So to deal with this problem, 
I'll click on Refine Edges button up here in the option bar. This is the Refine Edges panel. I'm changing the view mode from black and white to on black. Because of the black background, we can see what the problem with the edges of the model is. Now start painting on the edges of the model and see how it is subtracting some of the unwanted white color pixels from the selection. It has removed the rough edges and made them softer. Let me change the view mode to black and white. Keep in your mind that black means transparent and white means opaque. Here are some parts of the model that has been transparent, so for that, select Erase Refinements tool and correct the selection. But this is not a big issue, so we can deal with that later. You can see here some transparent pixels around the edge of the model in some specific portions. So now, change the setting of the Output option, select New Layer with Layer Mask from the drop-down list, press OK. You can see here in the Layer panel, a new layer is created with Layer Mask. Now see these transparent pixels here? To deal with that, just duplicate the layer by pressing Ctrl plus J, and you can see our problem is solved. You can see with the help of this cool trick, we have extracted the model very nicely. Now I'm going ahead to our next extraction technique. In this technique, we will talk about luminosity-based selection. See here is an image of smoke. In smoke, some portion is full opaque and some portion is half transparent. So we want to extract the smoke with proper transparent pixels. In a previous technique, we have done our selection with the magic wand tool, but here it will not be the proper technique in the case of smoke. So here we will use the channels palette. In the channels panel, hold control key and just click on RBG panel on the top of the channels panel. It loads all the brightness value as the active selection. It has selected the entire white background. Now go to the select menu and choose inverse. Then press Ctrl plus J to create a new layer of the selected portion. You can see here a new layer is created from that selected portion, but it looks very flat. So to maintain its density, select the layer and press Ctrl plus J for around five times and merge all the duplicated layers. Now you can see with the help of this trick how perfectly we have extracted the smoke. This is called luminosity-based selection technique. Let's move on now to our next example. Here is a model and we want to extract her hair very quickly. If we use the pen tool in this particular image, then it will be time-consuming process. But if we do not need to waste more time on this, we can do this very nicely and very quickly with the help of the Refine Edge option. Grab the Quick Selection tool and select the model roughly. Click on Refine Edge option. Select View Mode on Layer. And start painting around the edges of her hair. You can see how it is refining the selection around the hair. Look, some unwanted pixels are also removed from the selection. I'll take out this selection as New Layer with Layer Mask. Look here, a new layer is created with the layer mask and the model is extracted very nicely. Take a duplicate layer so that we can deal with some transparent pixels around the edge of the model. So these are some cool and quick tricks for extraction in Photoshop CC. In the next video, we'll talk about how to work with the brush tool in Photoshop.
In this video, we will talk about the basic functions of the brush tool in Photoshop CC. And we will also talk about brush options to manage behavior of the brush in different ways. Now go and grab the brush tool from the toolbar. And the first menu in the option bar is Brush Preset Picker. Here we can change the brush tip. And this menu shows different types of icons, which are actually different types of brushes available. Now click on this small wheel icon. Here you will get a list of the different groups of preset brushes. These brushes are inbuilt with Photoshop. If you want to add any brush preset, just click on it. I choose square brushes. Then it will ask you to append brushes or replace them. Append means it will add them to the existing list of brushes, and if you click OK, then it will replace all brushes together. Now, if you have a set of brushes that you downloaded from the internet, to add those brushes, you need to go to the end and choose Load Brushes. Let's talk about editing the brush. I'm choosing a soft edge brush here, and you can see right above it, Size and Hardness. You can set the size of your brush, and Hardness determines the hardness and softness of your brush edge. If I keep hardness to zero, then the brush will paint with very soft edges. And if I set hardness to 100, then it will paint with very hard and sharp edges. And the brush is going to paint whatever the color you have set as your foreground color. Right now it's black, but if I choose red, then it will paint with red. Now one more thing is, we can also apply blend modes to brushes. If I choose overlay mode and paint with the same red color, then it will blend with the background image. I can also play with its opacity. If I want to paint with the same color with some transparency, then I need to drag down the opacity. And the flow determines how much area the pixels flow to when clicking the brush. If I want to resize my brush, then this is the shortcut to do it. Just press left bracket and right bracket to size up and down. These are some very basic features of the brush tool, but to become more creative, we need to go ahead one more step by adding behaviors of the brush. For that, I need to go and click on this icon up in the options menu next to the brush preset picker. It will open up the brush options panel and we can also open it from the Window menu and select Brush to open the same panel. In this panel, at the top of the list of options, in Brush Tip Shape, we have the same options as we have seen before in the Brush Preset Picker, such as Size, Angle, Roundness, Hardness, and Spacing. Check on these items below. If I want to change shape dynamics, then just click on that, and you will get its options to modify brush behaviors, such as size jitter. Just keep it in your mind that jitter means it randomizes that feature as you paint. You can also choose different controls, such as fade, pen pressure, pen tilt, and stylus wheel. Let me change my brush so you can see the effect of every option when I change it. You can see this preview panel at the bottom of the brush panel. Here we can see the changing behaviors of the brush as you change them. So you have size jitter, angle jitter, soundness jitter, and much more. The brush will paint according to how I set the different values in this panel. Next, I can scatter the brush. I can increase or decrease the count of the brush when we paint. And we can set the count jitter too. You can see it looks very nice. Next, I can give texture to the brush. And for that, 
Go to the Pattern Picker and choose any texture you like from the Texture menu. And modify all other behaviors per your requirement. In Dual Brushes, we can use two different brushes at the same time with the help of blending modes. And we can modify their size, spacing, scatter, and count. I can add color dynamics to my brush, and the color of the brush will be between the foreground and background color. And we need to set Hue Jitter, Saturation Jitter, Brightness Jitter, and Purity to get proper output. In this Transfer option, I can randomize the opacity and flow of the brush. You can see the changes in brush opacity in the preview panel. Brush Pose is the new feature which is able to modify the tilt and rotation of any brush. You can use Noise to give a little bit of noise effect to your brush. Wet Edges will give a more natural look to your brush. It can give a wet watercolor look. Build Up allows you to build up on top of it in a natural way, so you create as if it was with real brushes and natural colors. Smoothing makes things look smoother. And you can protect your texture on the images by checking on the Protect Texture option. So you have lots of options and behaviors with brushes. And you can make various types of brush designs every time and increase your own creativity. Now in the next video, we will talk about how to work with text in Photoshop. In this video, I want to show you a few basics of text in Photoshop. There are a number of ways you can use text while designing in Photoshop. So let's grab the Text tool from the toolbar. If you click and hold on the Text tool, you can see various types of text tools like Horizontal Type Tool, Vertical Type Tool, Horizontal Type Mask Tool, and Vertical Type Mask Tool but most commonly, we will use the Horizontal Type tool. Now just click on the canvas and see that in the Layers panel, a blank text layer is created. Let me type guru99.com free online education. To make a selection of text, just double click on the text layer. Look here in the Options bar for some options to modify the text. Here you can change the font styles of the selected text. There's a huge list of font styles to choose from. Here you can give some normal font effects, such as bold, italic, or regular. By this option, we can set font size. You can click and drag on this icon to increase or decrease font size. Here are some font adjustment options. Click this icon to open the Character panel, which contains all the settings for text. We can also get this panel in the Window menu. In this panel, we have the same options we saw in the Options bar, and many more options like Kerning, Tracking, Vertically Scale, Horizontally Scale, Font Color, and many more options to modify your text. Now make a selection of text by double-clicking on the text layer and pressing Ctrl plus T to open Show Transform. You can drag and scale text non-destructively. Notice here the font size of the text and then scale down the text. When you press Enter, you can see the font size is also changed. You can scale up and down the text as you would with an image, but still not lose any quality after scaling as you do with an image. Because when we scale the text, it is not resampling the text. In fact, it is resizing the text so it can be scaled non-destructively. Now, if you want to change font style, then select the text and open this list of font styles. You can choose any of the font styles from this list. And if you want to check all the font styles one by one, then just click on the font style name and keep it selected then start pressing up and down arrow keys to go through all of the font styles one by one. 
Let's talk about kerning and tracking. Kerning means adding or subtracting space between two specific selected characters. Tracking means loosening or tightening a selected block of text. Let me change the color of this word so that you can see the difference clearly while changing its tracking value. But first, we will change tracking for the entire line by clicking and dragging this icon. You can also set tracking space between two individual characters. For that, just click between those two words and put your cursor there and the shortcut to change the tracking value is to hold the ALT key and press arrow keys left and right to increase or decrease the space. You can use the same shortcut when you want to change spacing in an entire line. We can also scale our text horizontally and vertically by changing the values in the Vertically Scale and Horizontally Scale option. So now let's talk about text on a path. Let me draw a shape as a path so we can put some text on it. Now look at the cursor. When it's on the canvas area outside the path, it looks like a normal text tool cursor. But when I keep it over the path, then it will change. And that changed cursor indicates that your text will be sticking to this path. Now click on that path and you will be able to type your text following that path. And you can also determine the starting point and the ending point of text on the path. So select the text, then press and hold the control key, then put the cursor at the start of the text. You can see the changed cursor. Now click there and drag the cursor so you will be able to see two different points. A little cross indicates that this is the starting point of text, and the little dot symbol indicates that this is the ending point of the text. So you can't go out of that limited area. You can change those points by holding the control key, then clicking and dragging them. You can flip up and down the text around the path by moving the cursor in and out of the path area, but keeping hold of the control key. We can also do this on a simple path drawn by the pen tool. So let's check it out. Grab the pen tool and draw a simple path. Now take the text tool, click on the path, and start typing. And you see here, you have the same features as we have seen previously in text over the shape path. Now let's talk about customizing font styles. Sometimes a font style can't give you exactly what you want. So in these cases, you need to take some text and modify that as per your requirement. You can do this by converting the text to path. Let me type a word, Guru99. Then right click on the text layer in the text panel and choose Create Work Path. It will convert your text to a path that you can easily modify. Switch off the text layer and you will see it has generated a path around the text. And look, here in the Paths panel, a work path is created. Save it first. Now if you want to modify the path, then just grab the pen tool and select some control points which you want to move and set them according to how you see the design in your mind. You have to hold the control key then click and drag any control point the way you want. You can see how I've modified the font and created a new design. If I think that I can work only with the provided font style to get my output, then I will not be successful every time. 
Sometimes we have to modify the text for our needs. So these are some features about text. And in the next video tutorial, we will talk about filters. In this video, we will discuss some basic filters inside Photoshop CC. Filters are like layer styles. They have various types of effects and combinations of effects which you can apply. There are a number of designers who use filters and work with them very deeply to come up with many creative combinations and images. Here I have an image on which I'm going to apply different filters to make it more effective. Look here in the filter menu. Here you have a bunch of different categories of filters. I suggest that instead of paying attention to the filter names, you should apply them one by one and check what they're really doing with your image. Because the output of any particular filter is totally dependent upon the image on which you're working. Here we have Blur, Distort, Noise, Stylize, and many more groups of filters. The Filter Gallery is the option where you can see the preview of all the effects of filters before we apply them. Look, here is the list of filters which we have seen before in the Filter menu. You can also apply the same filter effects from this drop-down list which contains all the filters together in a single list. Let's try some filter effects on our image. Make sure this eye must be on so that we can see the preview effect of every filter effect on the image in the preview panel. Now just click on the filter which you want to apply to the image. You have to experiment with every filter to find the proper effect for your image because filters give different outputs for every different image. Let me try the poster edges filter. Here you can see some options to modify the effects of the selected filter. See the changing effects in the preview panel when I drag these options left and right? Finally, when you're done experimenting with filters, just hit OK to apply the final effect to the image. Notice the difference in our image after we have given it the filter effect in the filter gallery. It has sharpened all of the edges and made the image look like it's painted. Let's try to make this image more effective. For that, let me take a duplicate of the layer. Here you can see a set of different blur effects. I choose Gaussian Blur. It will blur the whole image. Set its value around 3 or 4 and hit OK. Now change the blending mode of this blurred image to Overlay. You can see how the feel of the image is improved, even before we have given any effects to the image. It was a very dull image, but now the colors and feel of the image have improved very much. So I hope you got the basic idea of filters, and how we can use them, and how they can help us to raise our creativity. Guys, this was the last lesson of our course Photoshop CC for Beginners with Guru99. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have enjoyed this course. You can visit our website www.guru99.com for more free online education courses.